uh, my name is Jody. Welcome to uh, this week's Long and McQuaid live stream. So today I'm going to be talking to you about ukuleles. Um, so uh, ukuleles are one of my favorite instruments, so I'm very excited to talk to you today. Uh, so today I'm going to be covering a few things. Um, the history of the ukulele, where did it come from, why is it so popular. Um, I'm also going to be covering how to find your ukulele. Um, everyone's got the perfect ukulele for them and I'll help you out with with how to do that. And um, lastly, we're gonna do a bit of a lesson. So if you have, uh, if you don't have a ukulele, that's okay. If you have a binder, um, or if you have a ruler, or if you have anything that you can sort of place your hands on and pretend, that's perfect. Uh, hold on to that for later on in this topic. Um, so, why me? Why am I talking to you about ukuleles? Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I have been in love with music probably my entire life. I have been singing since I could speak. Uh, tried a few instruments when I was younger. Played the clarinet in band in grade school. Uh, tried very hard to play the bass in high school. And I wasn't terrible at it, but it still didn't really click. It was still sort of uh, a struggle to try and figure out where my hands were going and to move them fast enough and it just didn't really work. So eventually I sort of let that go. Um, tried guitar for, well, tried guitar a couple times actually um, as an adult, but uh, I have really tiny hands. You can't really get a sense of like, I have stubby fingers. Um, same reason that taking a uh, piano didn't stick for me either. So guitar just wasn't the right fit for me either. Um, I couldn't get my hands to stretch as far and um, I just wasn't making any sort of progress at all and uh, so I, I gave it up um, and I wasn't really making music for um, a long time, a couple years, uh, but I'm very lucky in that I have some uh, very talented and um, very encouraging friends who sort of pushed me to keep going and to get back into music. So I saw the ukulele on uh, TV one day and I decided I'm gonna try the ukulele. Um, it seems like it'd be a fit for me. Um, let's see what happens. So I uh, jumped on Google and Googled ukuleles and the first thing that came up was of course Long and McQuaid and they had these Denver ukuleles for about $50. And that was my price range at the time, and so that was perfect. Um, I went that week to uh, my St. Catharines Long and McQuaid, and I grabbed myself that Denver uke and uh, fell in love. So I have been playing now for about seven years. Um, I play a variety of sizes, I play a variety of styles, and I'll go over all of those with you uh, later on. But um, it's sort of like in Harry Potter when the wand finds the wizard. This is, the, the ukulele chose me, and we are uh, sort of a perfect fit. So uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here, and also why I'm so glad to share my love of the ukulele with you. So a little bit of history on the ukulele. I'm sure, like most people, when you think of the ukulele, you think of Hawaii. Um, that lovely music that played us in earlier was very that sort of style. Um, and there's obviously a reason for that. The ukulele definitely uh, started in Hawaii, but it didn't start with Hawaiians. So the story of the ukulele begins actually in uh, the late 1870s. There was a large influx of Portuguese immigrants to Hawaii, and they brought with them a lot of their culture and a lot of their skills um, to Hawaii when they came over, as most people do when they immigrate. And one of the things they brought was a four-stringed instrument called uh, machete de braga. And I'm probably butchering that, and I'm really sorry if you speak Portuguese. Um, and it was a four-stringed instrument and uh, similar to the ukulele, but it was steel strings and not um, nylon, or I guess at that time it would be cat cut. Um, and so it sort of got adapted. Uh, now legend goes that there were three cabinet makers that came from Portugal to um, Hawaii, and they brought a lot of their stuff with them, 
but there wasn't really a huge need for high-end cabinets in Hawaii. So they sort of switched gears and decided to build instruments. The instrument they built, they took the idea um, of the Machete de Brega and they used what was available to them. So in this case, it was a uh, koa wood, which is natural to Hawaii. And they started sort of adapting the koa wood to work with their existing instrument. And that's where we got the ukulele. Um, now it could have just stayed sort of a, a local thing. However, the king at the time heard the ukulele and he was a great purveyor of the arts. And so he decided that the ukulele had to be played at every royal event. And so similar to white wedding dresses and that being inspired by the queen, the love of ukulele and the uh, sort of saturation of it within Hawaii started off with the king who decided that this was the peak of instruments and this was their instrument. So that's sort of why we believe that, you know, it's, it's a Hawaiian instrument and it is, it's sort of a marriage of, of Hawaiian and uh, Portuguese craftsmanship. So why do we know about the ukulele? Um, in 1915, there was the Panama Pacific International Exhibition. Um, it, exhibitions were a really big thing. Like I know we have the X here in Toronto every year, um, but back then it was really the only way you could sort of share culture and learn about other places. Obviously there wasn't an internet and there wasn't a lot of travel either. So unless you were really determined to visit other places, you weren't going very far outside of sort of mainland uh, US or North America. At this pavilion, there was um, a um, Hawaiian pavilion in this expo and it had Hawaiian culture. Um, so a lot of dancing, music, food, all that kind of thing. Uh, because Hawaii had recently become part of the U.S. at that time. So there, of course, was the ukulele. And that's sort of where the mainland got a taste of the ukulele for the first time, was just checking out this pavilion. And that there was over uh, 19 million people uh, that checked out the pavilion during the course of the expo. And the expo was months long, um, so they had time to sort of visit and check out the ukulele and it became a big hit. So the ukulele became ingrained in uh, jazz music, bluegrass music, um, sort of became a, a staple. And um, it wasn't seen as sort of cheesy or anything like that, like it kind of can be sometimes today. Um, it was a serious instrument. And um, so that's sort of where we get uh, the influx of ukulele into current music and popular music was during this time in the 1920s uh, when it became sort of a, a mainstay. So because the ukulele was a mainstay and it was uh, part of popular culture at that point, um, Hawaiian culture became big business. Uh, kitsch was all over the place. You got you know your hula girls on the, the dashboard and all that kind of stuff. That all started happening um, around the 1920s. Sears, Roebuck, um, started mass producing ukuleles. And they were a plastic ukulele and they were sold for about $5, which uh, back then, yes, it was a lot, but at the same time, it wasn't a piano and it wasn't, um, you know, like larger instruments, uh, accordions were very big then. Um, it wasn't overly expensive. So even through the depression, they were still able to sort of save up and pick up a ukulele. So because they were mass producing them and they were mass producing them in, in plastic, uh, it was really sort of accessible to everyone. So we do have, um, that side, a plastic ukulele with us. So this would be probably not exactly, but relatively similar to what you'd find um, back in the day. And this is a Beaver Creek. And um, of course you can find this at Long McQuaid. Um, so the Beaver Creeks uh, are great ukuleles. Um, they sound a little, um, it's hard to describe the sound. It's very sweet um, and it's great for, uh, especially for, for kids because it's very durable. Um, it's great if you want to take it on the boat, um, camping, that kind of thing. So this is super
similar to what they would have had back then um, with the plastic ukes. Okay. So that is uh, the 20s. So it, it kind of died down a little after the big push for Hawaiian culture sort of ebbed. And um, the next time we saw really a big insurgence of ukulele popularity was in 1950. So in 1950s, um, Arthur Godfrey was uh, a big name in TV. Uh, I had never heard of him up until recently, but ask your grandparents, I'm sure your grandparents know. Um, he had two evening shows on CBS. He had a talk show. He also had a talent show that was very similar to sort of um, America's Got Talent, that sort of thing. And he'd uh, display lots of different types of music and lots of different instruments. He was also a lover of ukulele. He uh, discovered the ukulele from uh, a Navy sailor when he was on tour. His bunkmate was from Hawaii and had a ukulele and um, fell in love. So Arthur Godfrey convinced CBS to offer a 15 minute ukulele lesson program. So it didn't last a long time, but uh, TV was just becoming huge, right? It, it's that sort of that era when TV was a thing that was new and shiny and having someone come into your home through the TV teaching you ukulele exploded it. So um, there was tons and tons of ukuleles going out at that point. He sort of was single-handedly the big push for the revival of the ukulele in the 50s. He actually had his own signature ukulele. So um, his signature ukulele actually sold, what is the number here, 9 million signature ukuleles, which uh, at the time, it was a lot of ukuleles. It's still a lot of ukuleles now. Uh, so he was the big push for that. Um, but, I mean, if things that go up always come down, and unfortunately, right on the heels of the ukulele's burgeoning popularity, like Elvis was playing it, and you know, like everyone was playing the ukulele, and it was great. And then the Beatles happened, and rock and roll became this huge thing, and suddenly this sweet instrument with its, you know, warm and mellow sound was not cool anymore, um, and. Godfrey actually made the astute point that a uh, boy's not going to get into trouble with a ukulele in his hands, which is absolutely the truth and unfortunately one of the reasons for its decline throughout the uh, 60s. You just, you can't compete with the Beatles and with guitar when that's sort of the driving force. Um, so it was still sort of popular, it was still used in bluegrass and um, things that sounds like that, like more country-ish sort of stuff. Um, however, then we get to Tiny Tim. Um, now, you may or may not be familiar with Tiny Tim, but Tiny Tim was a musician slash sort of a, a performance artist. He was a very large man with purposely ridiculous hair um, who played a tiny little ukulele with falsetto singing. Um, and famously, he went on late night TV and sang a very high-pitched, warbly, awkward tiptoe through the tulips and doomed us all to unfortunately being seen as rather awkward. So that was sort of the final nail in the ukulele coffin for a long time. Um, no one really wanted to be associated with Tiny Tim and yeah he was funny and it was great but it, it, it wasn't seen as a serious instrument anymore so um, go Google Tiny Tim if you haven't yet uh, you'll get a good laugh out of it it is later not now um, but it is it is funny and it is fun to watch now but it, it did sort of do a little bit of damage to the ukulele um, so the next sort of big push for the ukulele uh, was obviously the one that we're still sort of riding. Um, and it's in the 90s. Kids that didn't grow up seeing Tiny Tim and didn't really know the association started getting more into ukuleles. 
So you had, um, you know, rockers and, and that kind of thing, trying the ukulele, putting it in their music, trying some stuff out, and it sort of started building. And it kept sort of building. So where we're at now um, is sort of the, the heyday of the ukulele, um, golden era, if you will. We've got um, 21 Pilots coming out with ukulele tunes. Eddie Vedder has an amazing entirely ukulele album. Um, which adds, you know, a little bit of legitimacy to the ukulele, Eddie Vedder. Um, <clears throat> there's Grace Vanderwall, who um, won America's Got Talent and uh, with the ukulele. She's fantastic. Uh, Billie Eilish, who currently has ukulele songs. Um, tons and tons of artists out there that are playing the ukulele. And so it, it, we've been clawing our way slowly out of being this sort of ridiculous thing to now, yes, it is a legitimate instrument. It is an instrument, um, you know, with as much value as guitar or bass or anything else, uh, which for me is great because, like I said, this is, this is sort of where my heart is in terms of instruments. Um, at the moment, I think the last numbers I have are 2003, there was a 54% jump in ukulele sales from 2013 to 2014. And it's only sort of increasing. Um, every year at NAMM, uh, we take a look at uh, new ukuleles that are coming in. So there have been some really cool ones coming in from guitar manufacturers. So they're starting to sort of embrace the ukulele. Um, you can see behind me, I have a Les Paul ukulele, um, which is a, a great little piece that I'll show you a little later on. Um, but it is legitimately a, an Epiphone Les Paul, so that's wonderful. Fender has come out with um, a couple of really cool ukuleles that um, mimic the shapes of their popular guitars that um, sound great. Uh, we've got a few in at my location and um, yeah, sound fantastic, which is really kind of the key, right? Like it's all well and good to have a ukulele that looks fun, but you really want something that's gonna sound nice. Um, so that brings us to how to find your ukulele. Um, so, a couple of things to know about the ukulele. <clears throat> this is um, this is my favorite ukulele. Um, it's sort of my around the house ukulele is what I like to call it. And it's, it is um, just a, a regular um, soprano uke. So sopranos are the smallest size. There are four different sizes of ukuleles, um, plus a few that I, I won't really get into detail with because they don't really matter, but um, there are four basic sizes of ukuleles. So this is, uh, as I said, soprano. So this is the smallest, um, along with the uh, Black Beaver Creek. That was the smallest ukulele there. So uh, playing it. It's got that sweet, um, very sort of happy sound that you expect from ukuleles when you hear them. Um, it's also known as the standard ukulele. So this is sort of what everyone uh, goes off of. Um, now ukulele scale wise, uh, it is 14 frets. Um, it is 21 inches in length and uh, like most ukuleles are tuned to GCEA. Um, there is a difference and I'll get into that one later but um, so this is ukulele same as a basic guitar um, you've got your body your uh, neck and your headstock tuning pegs and um, bridge down there sound hole all that fun stuff um, not all of them have uh, pick guards because a lot of the times ukulele players will play sort of up here near the neck because that's where it's comfortable to sort of strum. So it, some of them do, um, as you can see, um, my Les Paul has one, but for the most part, most ukuleles um, don't. So this brings me to a question that uh, was asked on Facebook. How do you tell a left or right-handed ukulele? Um, now I will throw that out there that I am left-handed. However, I play right-handed because it's more comfortable for me, but if you look at the ukulele, I can play it this way, or I can play it this way, 
and the shape of it doesn't change. So it's pretty much the same one way or the other. The only difference when it comes to the ukulele is that you switch two of the strings. So other than that, any ukulele uh, you buy for the most part that is something like this, just a basic ukulele, you can swap left-handed, real easy peasy. Um, so I hope that answers your question there. Um, so this is soprano. The next size up is the concert. And that is, which one are you? You are concert. So my Les Paul here is a concert and you can see um, that it is a little taller. It's a um, little, uh, the frets board is a little longer. Um, it is generally, uh, they are 23 inches in length, um, 16 in terms of the scale, but 18 frets. Um, they, the tuning for this is a l the same um, as other ukuleles. And um, now this one's gonna sound a little different uh, because it is um, mainly um, an electric ukulele. So it does have a sound hole, but it also has a pickup as well. Um, I got this one specifically to be able to play and to, to plug in and play with a band. Um, it also has black strings, which you'll notice. Um, and I will talk about that a little later on. So this one. Hear that it's a little bit of a deeper tone. Um, now this one isn't quite as loud because it is thinner um, and so it doesn't have sort of the depth uh, of the ukulele the way that this one does that really sort of echoes that sound out so you can see that they're they're quite a bit different in uh, thickness. And you can get travel ukuleles um, that are similar to this that uh, are acoustic and they actually have a rounded back. So they're made to be played acoustically and, uh, but they're still flat. Uh, this one's kind of nice only because when you are holding it, um, it's not a big bulk on your arm. Um, so yeah, this is the concert ukulele and this is a Les Paul. There's that one. Oh, I'm walking away with the mic. So. Next up is the tenor. Just gonna clip that onto your. Uh... Apparently, I'm walking away with things. All right, so this one is a tenor, um, and we'll compare the sizes again. You can see that it is uh, quite a bit bigger than the soprano uke. So this one um, is, oh, and of course I've lost my sheet that had the links. <clears throat> so this one is actually uh, 26 inches in length. Uh, fretboard for this one is 18. So it's the same number of frets. Uh, the scale though is 17. Um, and this one is, uh, again, a little bit louder and a little bit deeper. So you can sort of see the difference. So you can hear pretty clearly the difference between the two in this one. Um, the soprano is much higher sounding, um, it's much brighter sounding, and the uh, tenor sounds a little bit more guitar-like, so you can hear the, the brightness in the smaller size. Um, now it is really good to have um, a larger ukulele if you do have uh, bigger fingers, and especially if you're looking to do um, sort of things that are a little bit more complicated. A bigger ukulele is a, a good call. So that is the tenor. Now the last one I'm gonna talk to you about is uh, a baritone. 
So a baritone uke is, um, it's similar, but different. So we'll grab that one and I won't fall apart this time. So this is uh, my baritone uke. And the baritone uke is, uh, as I said, same but different. So again, it is much bigger than a standard soprano ukulele. Um, if you look at them here, there are, you know, they, they look like your baby brother. And uh, this is, you know, the adult. So other than the size, the main difference with a tenor ukulele is a tenor ukulele is tuned differently. So everyone else uh, in the ukulele family tunes to G, C, E, A. The baritone ukulele uh, tunes to D, G, B, E. So it actually tunes to the same um, as the, the first four strings of a guitar. So it's very similar that way. So sometimes transposing can be uh, a bit difficult. Um, however, they do make ukulele capos. So a uh, capo is just a little plastic uh, piece or um, depending, uh, sometimes they're metal, but they just clip on and then they let you change um, your keys. So I'll play a little bit on here. Um, the other difference as well is that baritones have steel strings. So two of them are steel, two of them are nylon. So it's gonna have a little bit of a deeper sound and it's gonna be um, Um, but so this is a baritone, um, and yeah, it was a little out of tune, um, air changed in here. But um, it is definitely a fun one to play, especially if you're going from guitar to a ukulele. This is a good option because you can still use a lot of the same shapes uh, to play this, and uh, it is very similar. So those are the four. Now again, which one is best for you? Um, a lot of things come into play. What are you looking to do with your ukulele is uh, the first question you should be asking. Are you just gonna play around your house? Great, no problem. Um, are you looking to do live stuff? Are you looking to play with other people? Um, are you gonna join a ukulele group? There are lots of them out there. Shout out to the ukulele groups who've tuned in. Um, they are wonderful little communities. So, first question. What do you want to do with your ukulele? Um, when I started, as I said, I just got a little $50 um, Denver and I just wanted to play at home. I wanted to be able to, to strum and sing along and uh, have something that way. So that was my goal. So for me, that little black Denver was perfect. And then I got good um, pretty fast and I realized that that it wasn't gonna cut it for what I wanted to do. Um, I had some friends that were playing music and I had the opportunity to play and to sing along with them and so I needed something that plugged in. So that's where um, my Les Paul came in because as I showed you earlier, it does have that great little pickup. Um, and at the time, this was a couple years ago, so there wasn't as big of a variety um, at, you know, you didn't have to special order, it was just sort of there. Um, and that one was one that had a pickup that was available at the time. And so uh, we got that one. And um, it is a great ukulele and I'm really happy with it. Um, now the black strings on this, as I said, I'd talk about. So uh, when it comes to strings, they are nylon strings on ukuleles. Uh, these are Ernie Ball black strings. Um, as you can see, they are a little different from the ones I have on um, my soprano. My soprano are also regular strings. Um, they're nylon, nothing too special about them. Um, they're just, you know, standard Ernie Ball uh, ukulele strings. These ones are black. And the reason I use my the black strings on this guitar, or this uke, is as I said earlier, um, I mostly use this ukulele 
for playing with bands, for playing uh, live, and it's sort of my, my rock and roll ukulele, as I'm sure um, fits with uh, the Les Paul. So it has, uh, the black strings have more of a, a warmer tone, and it sort of takes out some of the plinkiness uh, that you can get with ukuleles. Uh, they are fantastic strings, so um, most Lange McQuaid's should have them. Um, all right. So, uh, we're going to show you uh, the pickup, which, as I said, is uh, fantastic. So, this doesn't have, um, some of my ukuleles that have pickups have little options. The Les Paul doesn't, that's okay. Um, it is an internal pickup, so it's not like a guitar where uh, there is sort of the, the J or the P pickups and they're on the exterior. Um, it's more like an acoustic guitar where you've got the pickup internally and it picks it up from uh, the inside. So I'll show you this one first. The other one I have that has a pickup is uh, my, oh, this side here, my eight string. So um, I'll, I'll talk about that after. But um, so I'm gonna plug myself in here. And if I could find the end of this cord. Okay. All right, so. This is plugged in. So that is a, an example of a ukulele with a pickup. So I'll show you what, um, we'll go back to my good old standby. And uh, so without a pickup, and we played these earlier, um, both with um, sound, like without a pickup. So you can kind of see uh, the difference with a pickup. So this one doesn't have a pickup. And it's sort of loud and bright all on its own. I'm going to show you uh, my 12 string and because I can play my 12 string both uh, acoustically and with the pickup. Uh, so you can kind of get a better sense then of exactly what it sounds like with and without. So I'm just going to swap these up real quick and pop this out. Yep. Okay. All right. So. This is um, sort of like the masterpiece in my ukulele collection. Uh, this is an eight-stringed Liho. Um, now, Liho is probably one of the better band, uh, brands if you're looking for an acoustic ukulele. Um, they make really good quality uke. Um, I'm gonna talk about the wood uh, in a little bit after this in terms of choosing your uke, but um, you can just sort of look at it and tell that it's like, it's made by people who also love the ukulele. So it looks really intimidating. Um, it can be really intimidating. It's um, instead of being four strings, obviously it's eight strings. Um, however, it works very similarly to a 12 string guitar in that, um, yes, it is eight strings, but you play them as if they are four. So Two of them are set to be um, a step down or a um, like an octave lower. So it gives you sort of a, a range of sounds. It's going to give you a little bit more like a guitar in, in that it's got uh, some highs and some lows, which is really nice when I'm playing with other people. Um, it's sort of nice to have that option. So I'm going to play it for you acoustic, and then we're going to plug it in and see how that goes. See, it sort of has the, the upper notes and the lower notes all at the same time. I'm still playing 
uh, the same chords, but it's just, there's extra strings. So that was that acoustic. Um, and we'll plug that in and show you how it plays electric. So this one has a Fishman pickup. Um, if you know anything about pickups, Fishman is probably one of the better companies in terms of pickups. So while it is a Leho guitar, or a ukulele, sorry, um, it does have a, a really good quality pickup in it. Um, it's got a, a tuner built in, which is fantastic when you have eight strings to tune. Um, it's also got some options um, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the treble, the middle, the bass, that kind of thing. Um, it's all at middle right now. We didn't test this earlier, so we may need to fiddle with it a little. Not pop that in. Okay, now important thing to know, this has a battery in it. So because it has a battery in it, if it is plugged in, it is using the battery. So if you have a ukulele out there that has a pickup um, or even a guitar and it's not working and you keep it plugged in a lot, 95% uh, of the time it's gonna be the battery. So check your batteries, unplug your things, important things. Okay, so. This is it plugged in. So I got a question about this. Um, do you hold two strings at a time between frets? Uh, the answer is yes. So um, if you want to zoom in on that, you can kind of see they are double fretted. So if I was playing a C, um, you hold both strings at the same time. So you treat them as if they are one string. And they just happen to be two. So um, you can hear when I... So when you do the, um, the standard, my dog has fleas, which is how us ukulele players remember um, how to tune. It is um, all those notes, but it's just um, a little extra. So that's, um, that's my eight string. So there are other sizes of ukuleles that I haven't really gone into because they're not as popular. Um, so one of the sizes is a pineapple, and um, as you can imagine, it is shaped like a pineapple. Now that's probably the most common alternative ukulele, I'll call it. Um, it has a little, a little bit softer of a sound. Um, it is a little different. However, it's not quite as made sort of widely as these sizes are here. Um, it is a neat little piece. Um, it, it sort of, it just is what it is. Um, so, uh, the other sizes, there is uh, one in between a soprano and a concert. It's like a sopranissimo. Um, not a lot of difference in sizes. Sort of why I decided to go with just the main four today. Um, I probably wouldn't have brought this, except that it's one of my favorite pieces and it is you know, part of my collection. So the last one I'm gonna show you that's part of my collection that is sort of um, a ukulele alternative is my banjolele. Um, so I'm just gonna unplug this. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so banjoleles have a similar history to the ukulele. Um, they were spawned out of the ukulele, however, they were sort of developed um, in the jazz era and in the bluegrass era to sort of accompany the ukulele. So this is my banjolele and um, she has been through it. So this is a Gretsch uh, banjolele. So it is a banjo slash ukulele. Um, and you play it the same way that you would play a ukulele, same chord shapes, same strumming patterns. The big difference is, of course, the shape of the body, um, is that it does have that banjo shape, and it has the banjo head. Um, so you can kind of hear it there. It's also got uh, the floating, floating bridge. So this, when I restring, I gotta 
make sure that's that's back in there. So that can be a, a bit of a, a pill to restring. Um, now this has, it isn't a hundred years old. It's survived a fire, so that's um, yeah. This is a, a beast. So when you're playing the banjalele, I always say the banjalele is um, it's best played in a group. So while it sounds fantastic on its own, um, it can be a lot. So it is a little loud. Um, so you get that kind of twangy sound um, from a smaller instrument. Um, so it's similar um, almost to a band guitar where you're playing the same notes um, as a guitar, but it's got that banjo body that really um, really kind of does it for you. So I don't play this one a lot. Um, one of the main reasons is, is this is super heavy. Um, and like most ukuleles, you can't put a strap on it. Now I, I could technically throw something sort of under here around the strings and maybe attach it there, but it's going to alter my sound. So you will find that most ukuleles do not have straps, um, or if they do, it's just sort of one peg and uh, then you would tie around. That's okay. Um, I'm gonna show you later on how to hold the ukulele uh, properly. And it, once you hold it, it's not really that bad. But as I said, this one's really heavy. So when I really get into it, um, I end up with quite a few creases on my forearm here because I, I'm just gripping this thing so hard and, um, and playing. It's also one of the reasons you find um, a lot of people play closer to the neck than the sound hole. Um, a lot of guitar players you'll find, you know, play through the sound hole and they play by the, the pick guard. Um, not so much with ukulele because you're holding it with your forearm. Most ukulele players play a little closer to the neck there. So that is my collection of ukuleles. Now, how do you know which one is the perfect size? Um, so we've discussed sort of what you want to do. Um, do you want to play by yourself at home? In which case, you know, something like this would be great. Do you want to play with friends? In which case, um, you know, something with a pickup would be fantastic. Um, are you really into country or bluegrass and you want to play a banjalele? Awesome. Um, go for it. They are a, a lot of fun. So you've got that narrowed down. Um, you want to get one of these ukuleles. So what size? Um, size sort of depends on you and uh, your physiology. So as I said earlier, I have really stubby fingers, um, which means for me, I can pretty much play um, any size ukulele with no problem. Um, I don't get a lot of crowding on the frets, and I don't find that there's a lot of issue with the stretch. The only one sometimes I have uh, a bit of an issue is if I haven't played um, my tenor in a while, sometimes the tenor is a bit of a stretch. Again, why I don't play guitar. So I'm just gonna put this down and um, then we will talk about sizes. Stay. Um, so in terms of what size you want, it all sort of depends, again, on your finger and on your spread. Um, so soprano being, again, the smallest, I've got lots of room for my fingers. If I'm making a G chord, which is uh, just three fingers, they're all pretty close together, but I have lots of room. If you don't have lots of room, soprano might not be the right one for you. Um, you might want to go with a concert or um, even a tenor. So size-wise, um, that's a good thing to think about. It also has to do with volume. Uh, so the soprano is a little bit quieter, and as you get bigger, you obviously get a little louder and a little deeper because again, you have more space for the air, more room, um, it's gonna amplify that sound a little better. Um, the way you can get around that with uh, some ukuleles is the rounded back. So some ukuleles similar to guitars will have a nice rounded back where it is gonna give a little bit more space and project that sound out. Um, so that's an option as well. Um, so, style, okay, size, Perfect. Um, now we're going to talk um, about some treaties. So in terms of wood, ukulele uh, traditionally was made of koa wood. Uh, now koa wood is native specifically and only to Hawaii. 
So um, like most things that are only located in a small, relatively tiny climate, um, there's not a lot of it kicking around and now. Um, <laughs> fair enough. So, um, yeah, there's lots of different kinds of woods that they do now. Um, now, I've had a, a, a question about tuning, so um, I'm going to show you some tuned. They were tuned about an hour ago. <laughs> Matt watched me do it. So, I, I swear, I know how to tune ukuleles. So, this is a, a snark tuner. Um, you can get ukulele specific ones, but uh, this is just sort of a generic one. Um, we carry these at Long and McQuaid. They're pretty reasonable. They're about 22 and change. Um, love them. They are uh, sort of a mainstay for, for those of us who spend all of our days tuning instruments. And trust me, I spend a lot of my day tuning ukuleles at work. Um, now when it comes to tuning, the uh, well, when you first get a ukulele, because they're nylon strings, they've got a lot of stretch to them. So what that means is that they're going to sort of fall out of tune pretty quickly at first. Uh, so if it's a brand new ukulele, you haven't restrung it yourself, just be prepared. You are going to have to tune it quite a bit in the beginning. Um, now, if you have restrung it yourself, um, what normally you do is you sort of pull it to stretch it as you're stringing. So if you see, I've got just a finger down here just to keep it from pulling away from anything. Um, but I'm just sort of stretching it a little bit uh, just to, to sort of pull some of that stretch out. Um, now this one I've had for years, so it doesn't fall out of tune really that easily. Um, so I'm going to maybe try with one of the other ones that I know was out of tune. Um, and we'll try that one. Um, so we're going to go with... The baritone was out of tune. The baritone was super out of tune. Um, yes, you were super out of tune. Um, now, so I'm going to clip this onto the top. Now these snark tuners have two different modes. Um, one of them is sound, one of them is vibration. Depending on what it's like uh, in your area, uh, you can use sound or you can use vibration. I know when I do my eight string, um, even though it comes with a tuner, I sometimes like to use this one. Um, and it, it is a real pain to tune that one by vibration because there are so many strings, you kind of have to mute them. So that one I normally do um, by sound. So to tune, you're just turning this, this baby on. Um, you probably can't see the screen. It is oh, yeah, we can. a little bit. So kind of dark but you get the point um, that's telling you where I'm at and uh, it'll sort of tell you what range I'm at so I can't read what range I'm at on the screen we've got in the studio here so I'm gonna look at it while I do this um, well, it's not too far off but it's not great so what you're hoping for is if you can zoom in there you can see that so you want that little blue in the middle there you want it tuned just so it hits that, then you know that you're on, that's a D. I'm playing a D. Um, if it's one way too far or the other way too far, um, you gotta sort of dial it back or dial it forward depending on where you're at. So, uh, so that's D. Oh, yeah. They're all just slightly off, um, which again happens. So what all I'm doing is I'm just plucking that one individual string um, and moving the pegs back and forth until I get uh, the arrow in the middle there. Now there are lots of different options for tuners. Um, as I said, my eight string has a tuner built in, um, which sort of does the same thing. It, it just, um, it's got three lights, uh, one on either side and as well as the little thing that tells me what, what note it's at. Um, it isn't sort of as exact because it doesn't have the, the bar that does this, so that's kind of why I like using these. Um, so, yeah, it was all just slightly off. Yep, there we go. Um, so that was tuning, which, not hard, there's only four strings, um, so it's pretty easy peasy. Let's try this again. There we go, much better. So 
you can see definitely now that I can play that a little nicer. Um, it sounds very much like a guitar, uh, which makes sense. It is tuned similar to a guitar. So um, as I said earlier, if you're looking to switch over from a guitar to a ukulele, uh, definitely the baritone is sort of where you want to go. Um, it's, it's the right start. And then once you get this, you can sort of transition if you want to to smaller ones. But um, this is a solid one. Um, now the other last sort of specialty uh, you, you can get that I didn't bring with me is um, you can actually get ukulele basses. So they've got rubberized strings which are very like bouncy and um, they're actually super fun. Um, I know a couple of ukulele groups, my local ukulele group has a, a fantastic bass player that plays um, exclusively with one of those ukulele basses. So um, I didn't bring one because I don't like I said, I didn't love the bass, but uh, that is a ukulele option for you as well. So I'm going to put this one back real quick. And we'll go back to talking about uh, trees. So um, as I said, most ukuleles uh, at, back in the day were made of koa because it was easy. It was readily available. Not so much today, um, although quite a few guitars and ukuleles are still made of koa um, or they'll have a koa front and then other materials on the side. Um, koa isn't as common for ukuleles. Now obviously we do have them and we definitely carry them and they are great instruments, but a lot of the time now they're sort of plywood koa almost. So instead of being a solid piece of koa, it's uh, multiple boards pressed together. Um, they can be really good. Uh, like I said, Denver, I think Denver actually makes a couple of Koa ones um, that are uh, pressed together that way and they sound fantastic. Um, it's, I, I wouldn't be playing ukulele if it wasn't for my Denver. So um, absolutely you can get reasonable ones made of Koa. Um, if you're looking for a solid coal one, generally it's sort of on the higher end of the price range. Um, you can go pretty high with ukuleles. It starts pretty low, um, but like anything else, uh, price range wise, it's, uh, you can get sort of extremes. Um, luckily, I, I don't have, you know, too expensive tastes. Um, the most expensive ukulele on the wall. Um, is the eight string um, and that ranged for I believe uh, in the $800 range and that was a, a special order through my local Long and McQuaid. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean it makes sense that it, that's sort of that price. It is uh, a very specialty sort of ukulele. Um, but most of the ukuleles I have on the wall behind me and most of the ukuleles I owned um, are sort of in the, the 250 range and a little bit less depending. Um, I know the, the Epiphone, this one here, um, it's 219 I believe right now um, at most Long and McQuaid's. So the ukulele is like an affordable instrument. So that's the other thing you have to think about is what is your price range? Um, if your price range like me when I first started was an extra 50 bucks, you, you know, you scrape together, then fantastic. You can find a ukulele that, uh, that will do its job and will um, definitely sort of get you where you need to go. Um, if you have a little bit higher of a budget, and you want to get sort of a, something that's more of an investment, you can spend a little more and you can get uh, some really good quality uh, ukuleles. Um, now in terms of, as I said, uh, wood. So most common is koa. The next most common is mahogany. Um, a lot of ukuleles are made out of mahogany. Uh, this one here, um, is, yeah, this one here is a mahogany. Um, so is it mahogany um, front, back, and sides? Um, now mahogany and koa are all considered tone woods. So similar to an acoustic guitar, uh, a tone wood is um, a wood that's going to make for, you know, a, a good sounding instrument. Um, so mahogany is, um, it's dense but uh, it is a soft wood and it sort of vibrates just enough to get the sound out. Um, so mahogany is definitely um, a good way to go if you want to get a solid topped instrument and uh, you don't want to necessarily be spending a, a large fortune on koa. Um, so this one I think, 
this ukulele I bought, uh, it was a used one. So um, used are great deals, uh, especially sort of end of school year. Um, there's a lot of uh, used items that come into Long and McQuaid's and so you can get a pretty, pretty good ukulele um, for uh, less than $100. This one, I think new, is about 120 uh, used. I bought this for 80. Um, and as I said, this is my wander around the house, sitting on my back porch, playing ukulele. Um, I promise my neighbors don't hate me for it. Um, just a good solid piece, and I didn't spend a ton of money on it, um, but it is sort of my house ukulele. Um, it's one of the reasons I love the ukulele so much is that it is such a variety of price ranges that it really is um, accessible to everyone. And that's sort of the key with ukuleles is that um, they are for everyone. So you can be, you know, a pink haired weirdo or you can be um, a retiree and uh, join your ukulele group uh, locally and, and fit in and it's wonderful that way. So those are the ones I recommend in terms of wood. Now you can get uh, cedar and you can get rosewood and I know a lot of guitars, uh, you know, rosewood fretboards and things like that and they're, they're gorgeous. Um, but mostly for the ukulele, uh, we pretty much stick to koa and uh, mahogany. Sometimes you can get some spruce, things like that. Um, but those are sort of the, the staples of where you want a ukulele. So that's the other thing you need to worry about. Um, and look at when you're looking at the perfect ukulele for you is what type of wood is that ukulele? Um, is it a solid wood or is it a pressed wood? Um, so those are things to consider. Other things to consider when you're buying your ukulele um, is, you know, how well is this in um, just uh, the bridge here? You want to make sure that this is a good solid piece, that this isn't going to be falling out. Um, it's important, same with a guitar, it sort of keeps the strings where they need to be. It lifts them off of the body of the ukulele so that you have room to strum. Um, now if you didn't have that, obviously it'd be pretty flat and you wouldn't get a lot of room and you just sort of, it'd be muted. Um, unlike a guitar, you can't really change the intonation on a ukulele and that's sort of how, how far it lifts off. Um, but you don't really need to. It's they're all sort of the same and that's sort of the way they go. Um, and again, as I said earlier, you're, you're playing mostly by the neck anyways, so it's not like a big, big issue in terms of that. Um, so the other options are um, laminate and plastic. And uh, so the one here, as I said earlier, the Beaver Creek, that one is a plastic. Um, really good, especially if you uh, have young kids and the young kids want to learn a ukulele, um, which is great. I, um, during sort of the, the, the dark, the really darkest times of COVID, um, people would call in and I would recommend definitely ukuleles if you're looking to, to get something for your kids. Um, it's a really easy thing to pick up and it's a really, um, really friendly sort of instrument. So um, the Beaver Creeks are fantastic for kids. Same with the Denvers, um, you know, they are a great piece. You don't have to feel like, you know, if your kid snaps it or is pulling strings that you've spent a fortune on it. Um, so definitely recommend those. Uh, plastic, as uh, we, we heard earlier, it can sound a little buzzy, um, but it, it, you gotta kind of swap durability versus uh, sound quality, which is again, um, what do you want to do with your ukulele? Uh, if you just want to sort of have it around the house, campfires, plastic's a good way to go. So um, that is um, wood. Ew. Um, so we're going to get into a little bit of a lesson on ukuleles. So as I said earlier, if you have a book, if you have a binder, a ruler, anything that you can pretend is a ukulele, if you don't have one at home, um, sorry, excuse me, <coughs> now's a good time to grab it. And uh, we're gonna teach you some ukulele and I'm gonna play for about a minute to let you grab something.
grab something? OK, good. So I'm going to teach you three chords today, um, which can seem a little daunting. Um, however, these are three of sort of the, the easiest and the basic chords that will get you started. Um, I'm also going to teach you how to read a chord chart, which um, at first can be a little intimidating. I know um, when I was looking at chord charts, it was sort of a moment of like, what the heck is this? What does it mean? It's, it's almost like learning a new alphabet. Um, so I'm going to show you a blank chord chart. So this is what a chord chart looks like when you get um, a sheet of music. This is a blank one. So you'll notice it looks very similar to the fretboard on the ukulele. And that is because this represents this. So if we were to turn this on its side, that is where you, they want your fingers to go. So that is a fret um, pattern. So the first one I'm going to show you uh, is a C chord. So if you're looking um, at a chord chart, it's going to look like this. So what this dot means is that this is where you want to place, oh, I probably should have chosen a better color. Um, you want to place your finger there. So um, whenever you see chord charts, sometimes you'll see them, they have little circles, empty circles up top. Generally that means um, it, it's a, an, open, an open string, no big deal. Um, unlike guitar, and this is one of the other reasons I love the ukulele, when you're strumming, you always strum all the strings. So I know some guitar chords, um, you only string some of them, um, and then you don't strum others. And to be honest, that's kind of what drives me nuts, and that's why I don't play guitar. Um, very sorry to my ukulele teacher. Um, I won't ever do it. Uh, so this is a C. So what that means is that we're going to be putting our finger, um, let me just get the right hand here, on the third fret down. So one, two, three. So you want your finger there. Um, I like to use either my middle finger or my ring finger for C, um, just because it helps with jumping from one chord to another. But there are no ukulele police, so you absolutely can uh, choose whatever finger is most comfortable for you. Um, once you get used to hopping from chord to chord, you may change up which finger you use, which is okay. So we've got finger placement here. We're going to turn it on its side, and then you're going to strum. So strumming can either be done with your thumb, and quite a lot of ukulele players do it with their thumb. They use the palm of their hand, their fingers here, to support uh, the ukulele, and they strum with their thumb that way. Um, I have never been able to do that. <laughs> um, I can. I'm sort of uh, subpar at it. So I like to strum with my index finger, which means for me, the weight is on the, uh, the arm. So holding it. Out of order completely, but that's okay. So to hold your ukulele, um, now that you've got your binder or whatever it is that you're pretending is a ukulele today, so the best way to hold it is with your forearm. So what you want to do is hold your ukulele in your hand like this, stretch your arm out, fold it in and tuck it into your body. So you want to press the ukulele between your forearm and uh, your chest just to get it in there nice and tight so it doesn't shift around a lot, which again is the reason I don't play the banjolele very often. Um, and uh, so because the ukulele doesn't have straps for the most part, you can see this one doesn't have strap pins. Um, and putting strap pins in would change the shape of the ukulele pretty drastically. Um, there also isn't a lot of wood at this point in the ukulele, so that's one of the reasons that they don't put strap pins there, um, and it's, it's very difficult to get them put in. Um, so learn to hold it with your forearm. It's going to be a real, a real wonderful thing. So we've got finger on the C chord. So just the third fret down, one, two, three. And so to strum, again, I use my index finger. You can use your thumb if it's more comfortable. There are no ukulele police. 
No one's going to get upset with you or telling you that you're doing it wrong. If they do, they're probably not true ukuleleists in their heart. Um, so, <laughs> strumming is very simple. It's literally just an up and down motion. So you can do down, up. You can do down. You can do up and down. So this one I'm doing down, down, up. And on a lot of songs, you'll see uh, arrow notations. So you'll see um, two arrows upwards and one arrow downwards. What that means is that you are doing um, a down, down, up. Um, so the arrows are sort of showing you what the, um, which direction you want to be strumming your hands. Um, so if you ever come across that, that's what that is. So putting our finger on C and we're strumming. Okay, and so you want to get used to taking your finger off and playing open. So you want to get to a point where you can do that without really thinking about it. Um, muscle memory is sort of the, the key there. So in the same way that you don't have to think about what do I do when I stir something. You just, you stir something. You don't really think about how I'm going about that. That's sort of what you want to get to um, in terms of where you put your finger. So I know in my head when I'm playing C, I'm putting my hand right there and that's where my finger is going. So, good thing to do is just to practice on and off, on and off, on and off until you get it down. Then you can add another chord. So we are going to add another chord. Um, next chord we're going to add is A minor. So it's another one that's nice and easy. It's one finger. Um, you can see here, match up. So what we're doing here, sorry, everything on here is backwards for me. Um, we're going to this one here, so second fret down. So that is uh, A minor. So um, this one I like to use my middle finger um, just because as I said earlier, it's really easy to go from C to A minor if I don't have to move my finger from one to the other. So if I was using my index finger for both, I'd be doing this, which is, you know, all right in theory, but um, you sometimes get a little, a little gaps and it just makes life a little easier when you use different fingers for different things. So A minor. Second fret down, one, two. You're just pushing it down, and you want to push down in the middle of the fret. You don't want to be too far one way or the other. Um, you just sort of want to be in the, the sweet spot in the middle there. And um, make sure you put it down, and then you strum. So same with the C chord, you want to just practice taking your finger on and off the chord um, so you can get it sort of to memory. Once you master that, then you can switch in between the two. So to go from uh, C to A, A minor, sorry, pretty quickly. So that's sort of what you want to be doing is every time you add a chord, uh, whether it's one I teach you today or you want to sort of go about um, practicing going in between multiple chords. Um, it makes things a little easier when you add a different chord. Um, you already sort of mentally know in your head, my, my C looks like this. Um, my G, for example, I won't show you this one because it's a little tougher, but I can do a G shape sort of without having to look at my hands. Um, you want that sort of level of, okay, I know what I'm doing, I know that this is it. Um, so, last one I'm going to show you today, it's a big leap. Um, it is a two finger chord, and it is an F chord. So, if you can see here um, on the fret, so you want your fingers to be one here and one there. 
Um, so it's an A minor with a twist, basically. Um, so start off with your uh, ring finger, or sorry, your middle finger on the second fret for A minor. Pretend you're playing an A minor. And then you want to add your index finger on the second string, the top fret. So it's going to look like this. You're going to have a bit of a, a curve in this finger here because you want that pressure on there. And then, so this is an F. So two fingers. Really easy to go to an A minor. Back to an F. And then to a C. So those are three of the foundation chords. Um, now, there is a fourth chord, uh, the G chord, which is a little bit tougher, so I'm not going to show you that today. But um, with those four chords, you can pretty much play just about anything. Um, you might have to change the keys sort of one step down or two steps down, but it's, it's a really good foundation to have those four chords. Um, with the three I've shown you today, there are actually lots of songs um, that you can play. Let me pull some of these up. And so, um, let me grab. Okay. So, this one. Um, by Outcasts. It's one of the first songs I learned. Um, it was just a really fun one to do on the ukulele. Um, my, my jam, as it were, is I like doing um, 90s, um, 90s pop songs and um, grunge stuff on the ukulele. I think it's, it's really fun to sort of um, offset the type of music you're playing with the instruments you're playing. I, I like that juxtaposition. So, um, Hey Ya is a good one. Um, another one. Um, so, this one. That one is a pretty good staple as well. That's the Cures Friday, I'm in love. Um, so that's also one of my jams. Um, from sort of a, a more current, um, there is, with those chords, you can absolutely play uh, Ed Sheeran. So, um, and you can play that with the three chords we showed you. Um, so lastly, I just kind of want to talk about um, the ukulele community as a, a whole. Um, a lot of times in some other instruments um, that will remain nameless, it, they can get kind of competitive. Um, you know, who can play the best wah-wah pedal? Kurt Hammett, I'm eyeballing you. Um, you know, that's sort of th that macho sort of thing. Um, the ukulele is sort of free of all of that, um, uh, partially thanks to Tiny Tim and its ridiculousness, but um, just because it is uh, a very humble uh, instrument, it is definitely a folk 
instrument. It, you know, its, its origins are, yes, tropical and um, exciting, but uh, it is definitely sort of a, a folk piece. Um, so it, ukulele communities are um, wonderful and welcoming. Um, as I said earlier, there's no such thing as sort of a ukulele police. Um, there are definitely ukulele virtuosos who, um, there is an institution in BC actually uh, with a Canadian ukulele virtuoso, but um, it, it's not like anyone's going to be upset with you if you can't be, you know, a level level ten or you can't get to grade grade ten ukulele. Um, I, I don't see RCM putting out, um, you know, ukulele levels anytime soon. Um, they have yet to even embrace electric guitar, so. Um, it's welcoming. So if you've never played an instrument before, um, come on over, play the ukulele. If you've played instruments for years, come on over, play the ukulele. Um, I know that there are a couple of ukulele groups in my area that are very active. Um, there are ukulele groups all over the place. I know I saw a whole bunch of them um, in the comments to uh, sort of our ad for this earlier, you know, suggesting people check it out. And um, it's wonderful. So it's not just an instrument, it, it is a whole slew of people that uh, will embrace you and teach you and you don't need to be fantastic, you don't need to be, you know, shredding, um, just you come as you are with a ukulele and I think that's, that's probably one of the best things about the ukulele. Um, I know a lot of schools now, instead of doing recorders, kids are playing the ukulele and um, I'm sure parents are a little happier about that. Um, probably not a lot, but you know, a little happier. Um, so it, it is sort of an every, an every man instrument. Um, it is for anyone. I know a lot of the seniors um, play ukulele. Um, the group uh, in my local area is, is a lot of seniors and it, it's, it's wonderful, it's, it's a community. So um, Definitely, it is a wonderful instrument, and um, I, I like to think of myself as a ukulele success story. Um, first of all, because I have a job because of the ukulele, and um, you know, like moms are always like, why, why are you, why are you doing this? You know, you're not gonna get a job out of it. Um, thankfully, my mother never did that, um, but uh, she was very. Oh, I'm hitting the mic there. Sorry. <laughs> um, she was very supportive, but. Um, but I, I started playing, um, I got kind of as far as I could on my own and took lessons at Long and McQuaid and um, here I am working for Long and McQuaid because of uh, my ukulele love. So um, it can take you lots of places um, and you can take it lots of places. It, I was just saying earlier today when I was bringing my collection in, this is one of the reasons I started playing the ukulele was because um, I don't need roadies. Um, it's just me. Uh, I do have an amp. Um, I've got a cute little Vox amp that I use sometimes. It's a, it's a busker, so it's got like a strap, so it's travelable. Same with my ukulele. Um, so you do have some of that stuff, especially if you are playing with things like pickups. Um, but it's not a lot of equipment. It's just you and your ukulele, and um, most of them come with bags. Um, the Denvers all come with a gig bag. The uh, Beaver Creeks come in the big gig bag. Um, so lots of them come with it. If not, you can always grab uh, some really great gig bags. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna do some playing. If you got any questions while I'm doing some playing, feel free to shut them out and uh, kind of answer what I can. Um, but uh, otherwise, if nothing comes up, I'm gonna play myself out. Appreciate that. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Absolutely, every single one of you. Um, I wasn't overly sure how this was going to go. Um, the ukulele can still be a bit of a decisive instrument for some people, um, so I'm, I'm really glad that you guys are enjoying this and uh, that it's getting out there. 
Um, ooh, why in sleep tonight is a good one. Um, yeah, so Louise, um, I'm glad you enjoyed the clinic. Get more of your friends playing the ukulele. Uh, you can, I think we're gonna post this uh, later on. So you can rewatch and you can absolutely send people this way. Um, it's a great one for, you know, grandparents and parents at Christmas time. If you're not sure what ukulele to buy for your kids, um, check this out. Um, oh, um, my local one is, oh, yes. Um, it depends on your area in terms of lessons. Um, obviously, right now, there are not group lessons really anywhere. Um, but you can get... Um, I know most Long McQuaid's that are offering lessons at this time, a lot of them will offer ukulele. Um, so uh, they may do groups in the future. I know that was something that I was looking at when I was working in um, the, our lesson department uh, in St. Catharines as I was looking at sort of ukulele groups. Um, the other thing to watch for if you're into ukuleles or you're not sure is that we do uh, have ukulele days fairly often um, and hopefully once things get back to normal, um, we'll be able to have ukulele days again where you can literally come in and try a ukulele off the sales floor and we'll give you a little a little lesson um, i know i do them at my location and uh, it's just sort of a fun a fun day to try out the ukulele so it's um but yeah group lessons with kids would be a great idea i know the schools i think the schools are doing them as part of their music classes some of them um, but if they're not you can always suggest it because it's a much less germy instrument um, than playing the recorder these days, so something to think about. Um, my group um, in the area that I live in uh, is the Niagara and Lake Euxters. So if you're in um, Niagara, you can check them out. They're fantastic. Um, thank you again so much for checking us out and um, visit your local Long McQuaid for a ukulele and you, you could be sitting here in a few years time, who knows? All right, I'm gonna play myself out. Mm -hmm.